Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 494. In this episode, Scott talks with Rachel Reese from Jet.com about how Jet uses F Sharp, Azure, and other technologies to scale. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. On today's show, I've got Rachel Reese, who is an F-sharp developer at Jet.com. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. How are you, Scott? I'm lovely. I'm happy to be talking to you about this because I uh, I tweeted an article about Jet using uh, F-sharp and uh, pushing some pretty amazing scale. And the the tweets were like, I got like 150 retweets, like people are interested in this topic and what you all are doing at Jet. We are doing some totally amazing things. So... I am glad to see that we're getting some attention. I'm pr- I appreciate that. What is uh, so? What? Give me the the elevator speech on what what is Jet and what does Jet do? Uh, Jet.com is going up against Amazon. We're an e-commerce site. We are promising prices of ten to fifteen, even up to twenty percent below Amazon's prices. We're working on sort of a club model. Uh, you will have to pay a fee, sort of like an Amazon Prime. Uh, membership fee, maybe a, a Costco subscription fee, something like that. It'll be forty nine ninety nine a year. That will give you access to the site um, and all of our amazing cheap prices. Unlike Costco, as one point, you won't have to buy in bulk. It'll be the same regular items that you would be able to get on Amazon. Oh, okay. So you all buy in bulk and we we benefit. We don't necessarily buy in bulk. I mean, we will buy some things in bulk, uh, but we are... You have magic take, somehow. We have magic. We have lots of magic algorithms, um, but we're basically taking every single place that we can cut costs and passing those on directly to the consumer. We're making zero money on anything except the actual subscription fee. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> so any t- like uh, as you check out, if you are adding items to your cart that are from the same retailer, we can give you a percentage off because we know that we can ship those all together in a box. Um, they're coming from the same place. It'll be easier and faster to ship. We give you 1.5% off if you play with the debit card instead of a credit card. Um, we'll give you, you know, up to a couple dollars off if you waive your right to return something. There's all sorts of little places where we're cutting those costs down. So it is algorithmic. Like this is, and not to put too fine a point on it, right? But like, you know, there's only so many ways costs can be cut, but this is the magic of software. You are figuring out those pennies and half pennies and all the different potential ways. Like you just said, f- putting things in the same box saves money. Exactly. Why not pass that directly onto me as opposed to you taking the cut for shipping it in one box? Exactly. And there's, you know, a hundred different places where we can save you a couple pennies, which adds up to a couple dollars. And then you times that times my, my weekly groceries and suddenly I'm saving big money and I feel like I paid off my, uh, my membership fee immediately. Yeah. And in fact, uh, if you don't save up to forty nine ninety nine a year, we will refund the difference. Okay. That's cool. All right. So that's the, that's the elevator speech. There's the, the advertisement for lack of a better word for jet. Um, but the, the dynamic pricing system and the algorithms and stuff, what powers jet? And the the systems, like what's your technology stack look like? Oh, we are, we're using all sorts of things. Um, We are using F Sharp. We are using Azure. We are using microservices. We are using um, Reddit and Kafka and... That's a pub-sub system, right? So Redis, I know, is an in-memory database. And Kafka is the distributed log that you use as a queue. Um, You're an F Sharp expert. Yes, 
I don't and, know about expert, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, uh, I knew you as being a .NET person. When did you jump ship into F Sharp? Oh gosh, um, I first heard of F Sharp in 2010. Um, I don't remember exactly where or when, but. Uh, somebody said, you like math, so clearly you'll like this thing. And I sort of <laughs> <laughs> was like, That's a uh, compliment. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I don't really know how to read that, but sure, I guess I'll, I'll look at it. And I, I dawdled for a couple years. Mm-hmm. And I started toying with it a little bit, solving the Project Euler problems. Um, so you're just, a math person? I was a math major, yes. Okay. Um, I don't know that that actually has anything to do with why I love F Sharp, but mm, I think it does have something to do with why you do Project Euler things in your spare time for fun. Uh, that that would explain a lot, yes. <laughs> 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 um, but it's you know I started basically just toying around with it. You know I I didn't do much beyond that until I had moved to Vermont in I guess 2012 ish, mm-hmm. and I heard about a conference in New York f- solely on F Sharp. It was the Skills Matter Progressive F Sharp tutorials. Mm-hmm. It was the first year that we were running it. It was the first all F Sharp conference in the whole US. And I thought, this sounds really cool. This is my chance to really understand this technology, see if this is something I really want to be involved in. And so I bought a ticket. It was, I bought a super early bird ticket. It was like 50 bucks at the time and went down for the weekend and to this conference. And they had two tracks, a beginner track of, it was all tutorials. Um, and there was a, a beginner track of, you know, I've never even looked at the language and an advanced track. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the first day of the beginner track and it was, yeah, this guy, Chris Marinos had written a group of F sharp Cohen's. I know that Ruby has the same thing. I don't know if um, C sharp or other languages do, but it's basically a huge set of failing tests that to get you familiar with the syntax of a language, you just basically go through and make work. Mm, right. A Cohen is like a Zen thing. It's a it's a, a story to, to, to go through in order to learn. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, so they usually call it, they usually we think of Zen Cohens, and there's like, they're numbered Zen Cohens. They're parables. Okay. I have, uh, I've wondered this for ages and oh, yeah? have not gotten around to actually looking it up. <laughs> Well, it's like it's the motion that you go through. If you've ever done like martial arts, like if you do like Taekwondo, you have to learn this form. And so, so you do that same thing over and over again to learn exactly the, the appropriate form? Yeah, except you do it in F sharp or C sharp. And, and then you do Ruby, Ruby Cohen's or F sharp. So there's F sharp Cohen's and that's how you learned. And that's, well, that was what they were doing as one of the, the thing, the first things that day as the beginner group. And I thought, well, I've already done those. So I don't know that I'm advanced, but I'm going to go sit in the advanced group to figure out, you know, at least do something different. Mm-hmm. And the advanced group happened to be uh, a man ke- named Keith Batachi, who was partnering with Don Syme, and they were talking about type providers. And it was this totally brand new thing that year. I don't think they were even officially out yet. It was just these type provider things are coming, and we're going to tell you how amazing they are. Mm-hmm. And so what type providers actually are, are a, you know, a way to access data of any sort, anything that's schemaed out on the internet. Um, mm-hmm. You can access SQL Server. There's one for CSV. There's, uh, you know, many, many different ones of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a slide that shows like 40 different type providers that are in existence. Right. And as they talked, I just thought, this is the coolest thing I've even ever heard about. I I can't believe that the whole world doesn't know that type providers exist and why it, you know, I need to make this happen. And that was, that was sort of my defining moment was listening to these two guys talk about type providers. So type providers was like the feature, like it was such an attractive thing. You're like, this is where I need to be. You found your tribe. Exactly. Exactly. Very cool. So you find your tribe and then somehow you're, you start moving into F sharp and you spend a couple of years as an F sharp person. Jet comes along, you move to New Jersey (laughs) <laughs> yada 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 real time pricing yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> and um f sharp i hear about f sharp in the context of finance a lot why is that i think if i understand the history correctly uh it was billed as a um you know this is good for math and therefore this is good for finance and mm-hmm. science at the beginning and it does shine for those things, mm-hmm. but it's not like you can't do anything else with it. 
Right, right. It's just that's the thing that it's really it's really good at because like what you're doing with it with the dynamic pricing and algorithms, it's very algorithm focused, right? And algorithms need to be provable and they need to be well expressed. Is it just easier to express things like that in F sharp than it is in C sharp? I would say yes. I would say it's easier to express many things. And to be fair, we started with our pricing engine in C sharp and then ended up actually moving on from there because it was so expressive. It you know, we, we had less code, fewer bugs, all of that, yada, 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 that you hear all the time, mm-hmm. we really found to be true. And we ended up moving basically everything that we can do except for the actual, you know, our, our front end where we, we have some JavaScript, we have some Angular, you, you can't get away from that. Mm-hmm. But literally everywhere else in our code is F sharp. Wow. Okay. So the, the, the homepage, if I hit jet.com, that, that's ASP.net or what is that running? Um, it's not going to be ASP.net. Uh, I know that it's, it's using some Angular. It's using some Node, actually. Hmm. Um, it seems like more and more startups are picking hybrid solutions. Like, to, for, for a startup to do something in just one technology now in 2015 just isn't common anymore, is it? I would totally agree with that. We, um, we are not classified as either a Microsoft shop or an open source shop. We like to blend as much of everything as we can. Well, maybe not as much of everything as we can get in. But <laughs> Well, it sounds a little bit like Stack Overflow. Like sometimes people point to Stack Overflow as an example of a good Microsoft startup. But I don't think that's fair because they pick the technology that works. And they've got Redis and they've got, uh, you know, Nginx around there. They've got all sorts of stuff. And I assume that you're, you all are the same. So you picked F Sharp for the analytics because you felt that it was the right decision. Yes. And, you know, then obviously as we moved on, we picked it for, you know, our microservices and basically our entire backend. Okay. So the whole backend is F sharp? Oh, absolutely. All right. um, everything except, you know, the actual, you know, the JavaScript that's on the front end, literally everything else is F sharp. Mm-hmm. So is, was that a tough thing to sell? Because, you know, F sharp, it doesn't have the, 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 brand recognition, for lack of a better word, that C-sharp is. So was there some boss at some point who's like, I don't know about this thing. What is, What are they getting us into? Yes, actually. Um, so I just recently found out our our CTO was at that same Prog F-sharp tutorials uh, in 2012 or whenever that was, mm. and had you know started hearing about F-sharp at that same time and thought, this is really cool, and decided at that point to build... J- the pricing engine it was like that that seems like a good fit because all this finance and and all this science would be a, a perfect thing for for f sharp mm-hmm. and he hired a, a few devs to start working on this and we weren't sure if we wanted to build the rest of the site everything else in c sharp or f sharp so we actually had two solutions to start um we were building them completely simultaneously getting as many features in as we could um the very, very early days of, of Jet. Mm-hmm. And as we moved further along, it, it just became clear that the F sharp solution was, was working a lot better. It, um, as new people were hired, it was easier for them to step up and, and join in and make sense of the F sharp solution, even as C sharp developers. Really? Yeah. Because it was, it was just that much cleaner. It was, I mean, there was some syntax to get over and some ideas to, to form, mm-hmm. but, there were, there's a great blog post uh, by a man named Scott Vlashen who does, who has a website called F Sharp for Fun and Profit. Mm-hmm. He shows a bunch of dependency graphs of different F Sharp and C Sharp projects. And he compares specifically um, tick spec with, um, I don't recall the other one, mm-hmm. but one, you know, one is the F Sharp project and one is a, a very close equivalent C Sharp project. And the F Sharp project has maybe 30 or 40 dependencies. It's, it's a very small chart, whereas the C Sharp one has about 200, maybe 300, maybe more. You can't actually, like, you have to look really close on the slide to see all of the dependencies. And it's, that was sort of what we had found when, when we're looking at the, the F Sharp solution, the code is that much more powerful that there's, beca- and there is less of it that it's easier to keep all of that in your brain at once. Ah, someone was telling me just a couple of days ago that uh, it was actually a reporter who was doing an article and wanted to know if it's true that 
programmers who can keep the whole program in their brain at once are better than programmers who can't. And I thought that was, I had never heard that before. I thought that was unusual. And then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, this might be why we like to have our functions not scroll, right? Like if you have to scroll, it's too much because you need to hold it in your brain at once. And you're saying that like, let me give you this example and tell me if this works. We have 140 characters on Twitter, but the Chinese get 140 glyphs. They get to say way more. They can like write a book in a tweet while we're struggling to make things fit. Is F sharp kind of like that? That's actually not a bad analogy. Um, it's, it is sort of, you know, where it's, I guess because that, you know, one function can hold that much more information in it in a smaller set, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and being able to, so here's another good example mm -hmm. um, of the code just actually being smaller. If you think about a, a very standard object hierarchy, you might have your base class and two or three classes that would inherit from it. Okay. Um, and maybe some of them take a, a few different pieces of information. Uh, the, the example that I usually use is a transportation class along with like a bicycle class and sure. a car class. Right. Um, in F sharp, we have, uh, files in four different lines of code. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, heavy use of that feature cuts down massively on just sheer numbers of files. And mm -hmm. that cuts down on being able, you know, having to tab in, you know, look at 10 different things when you're trying to figure out one function. Mm -hmm. It also visually looks cleaner, I think, because of the lack of um, curly braces and parentheses. Like if you just kind of squint your eyes and look at it, there's less going on visually. Yes, that and... um F sharp has very powerful type inference, so the types aren't all listed out as well. Mm. And especially some of the the more complicated ones when you're adding funk types and they have, you know, three or four included things in there. Mm -hmm. You know, that can be almost a whole line of code just to to list the type. It seems like the only thing that is repeated a lot, like it's an extremely dry language. Uh, dry means don't repeat yourself for people who maybe not know that. Uh, the only thing that's repeated always is the word let. Like it's everywhere. Yes. <laughs> like, like if they could get rid of that, <laughs> it would be really, really terse. Hey, folks, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about Raygun and their new product called Pulse. Raygun is an error and crash reporting software provider, and their new product, Pulse, it's a real-time user monitoring product that gives you performance data and user insights, lets you understand exactly what's happening when users interact with your software, so you're never left guessing. Raygun provides you with the answers to your performance questions, and they've found over 10 billion, that's billion with a B, bugs in customer apps with their crash reporting product, and now Raygun will help you understand application quality like no one else. Over 30,000 developers worldwide can't be wrong. I use Raygun all the time, and I enjoy it very much. You can try it out today with a no-risk 30-day free trial. Start improving your software quality immediately. Try Raygun for free today at raygun.io. Now, what about these? Um, I'm looking at some F sharp code right now, and I'm seeing this thing where it's like let something equals something, and then there's angle bracket bang and angle bracket star. It's, it looks like a generic with a bang in the middle. Do you see that? Yeah, I do. I have literally no idea. That might be a custom operator. Ah, would be so my first thought. This is a really interesting point. Then you, it's almost like, um, like you know how people like to use Ruby for um, d DSLs for domain specific languages. Do people do similar things in F Sharp? They make their own languages. Very much. Very that that is a huge use of of F Sharp. Interesting. So when I'm reading F Sharp, how is it hard sometimes? Like right now, I just showed you some code, and you're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Someone has made their own their own thing. It can be. Um, I have definitely seen seen posts on, you know, trying not to overuse custom operators. There is a very specific time and place for them. Uh, a lot of the the DSLs that I've seen will not create, or the better DSLs that I've seen will mm -hmm. not create their own actual custom operators, but use, you know, create a word that would do the same thing instead. I'm looking here, and it says that this might be an applicative functor. So there are corners, apparently, in F-sharp that are really like powerful, but also obscure. 
Yes. And I... Uh, <laughs> that was the sigh of a person who has not explored all corners of the language. I feel like that when I get into Link and C Sharp. Yeah, that was that. That was also... Uh, F Sharp has such a reputation f um, for being this scary functional language that does yes. complicated. Yeah, yes. exactly. Let's talk about that. I mean, I just said applicative functor for the first time exactly. in my life. <laughs> and I've been doing this for 25 years and I have a degree. Um, that's really challenging. Like, how do you, is, is this why F Sharp isn't taking off from a, uh, a, a populist perspective? Like the regular Joe and Jane developer out there don't know what identity, composition, and homomorphism and interchange are. And that's, that's something that, that upsets me. Well, it just, it, this is one of the things that, yeah, that, that frustrates me because you don't have to have any concept of what any of these things are to actually use the language. Mm. It's like being able to use the apps on your phone. You right. don't need to know how to write one to, to do any of this. And uh, People will will start to learn about these things, you know, about monads and about functors and think this is really cool and want mm -hmm. to share this. Right. And you sometimes end up getting the impression that if you don't know this, you can't continue on. And That's really true. I mean, I, I'm looking at a blog post here, right? And within the first two sentences of the blog post, it says, uh, readers of this blog should have at least a passing familiarity with applicative functors. And then I click on that, and then I, th this is literally a sentence here. I have to share this with you. This module describes a structure intermediate between a functor and a monad, but technically a strong, lax, monoidal functor. Right? At that point, I'm like, okay, where's the data grid? I'm going to start dragging it. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> it's absolutely not, <laughs> but it's, it's not. unnecessary. It is unnecessary. Yeah. So talk to me about that, because you, you also so, train people in F-sharp. Yeah, so, well, m my first, I guess, counterpoint to that is, um, there's a member of the F-Sharp community whose name is Sean. Mm -hmm. He's a fairly new member of the F-Sharp community. But he gave a lightning talk at, at NDC Oslo this mm -hmm. past year. And I think he spoke at um, one of the DDDs in the UK. And Sean is sharp. He is knowledgeable on F-Sharp. He's speaking on like 3D objects and WebGL in F-Sharp. Wow. And I don't, I have, we'll be honest, have not watched his lightning talk yet. Okay. But I don't even understand what that means. <laughs> like, I know it's about 3D objects, but that is, you know, this eight-year-old has figured out something more complicated than... <laughs> oh, I saw that. I Yes, this is someone's son. I forgot the gentleman's yeah. name. Yes, so, absolutely. And, you know, if an eight-year-old can do this, then there's no reason that anyone can't jump in and figure it out. Perhaps it's because functional languages like Haskell were, 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 were for people from a math environment and they were taught in schools that it's done in such a academic way. Maybe there's an opportunity for F Sharp to become the people's language if it's presented in a, in a way that's more accessible. I would love that. And I, I think that's a totally reasonable thing based on my use and the, the times that I have trained people in F Sharp. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, let's trans, uh, let's change topics a little bit. I'm looking at the blog post that uh, was done on jet.com called Real Time Pricing, Real Time Advertising. And in it, uh, Louis Bacage, uh, who is a, another employee at Jet, said that it is safe to say we are pushing the .NET stack with F Sharp to places it's never been before. Uh, people at Google are telling us they've never seen this kind of volume. What are you doing that is pushing huge amounts of volume and taking .NET in new places? Um, we are so we have an event-driven architecture. Um, we are we are streaming zillions of events uh, constantly all day long, mm -hmm. uh, and managing all of that. Uh, we're pushing not just Google, but we're pushing Azure to its limits as well. We oh. have we found several different issues that you know we've had had to have the team come in and fix and i i would say that's definitely true for both things i know the event driven is part of it there's i mean we've been live a month now and we have i would say more data than most of the other places certainly i have ever worked so it seems like well from the point of view of myself and my wife you're going to send us you know uh soaps and things on the back end, this is a science company, and you're using analytics to to save us money. Our our CTO and even our our CEO has said that we are a technology company at our heart. Mm. 
and this algorithm or these algorithms are all tuned to find these these efficiencies and inefficiencies in the supply chain. And now, if I understand correctly, though, this this means that prices of your things change, and that's the essence of what all the code in F Sharp is doing. Is it's noticing this and changing prices? And then, is it true that you have to tell Google that the price on you know facial cleanser just changed at Jet? Yes, <laughs> yes, it is true. We need to and. Because these prices are changing so frequently, we need to tell Google this a lot. And I would guess that their back end is probably not meant to get that kind of information from you as regularly as you would want to send it. Uh, not at all. They are. They were quite surprised at, at the volume uh, with which we're pushing this this information over. I would think that you're almost like DDoSing them with your price changes. <laughs> and there were some jokes about that on Twitter after the uh, after Louis posted this this article, and I. That's not totally true, but it's it's <laughs> <laughs> probably compared to what they're used to. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like in order to push this kind of traffic, you're going to need to not just scale up, but there's going to be probably a level of parallelism that you don't usually see outside of languages like Erlang. Is F Sharp particularly well handled for well well designed for parallelism? F Sharp definitely is um, because of the functional nature of it, because of the immutability first. Mm. Um, it's it's very easy to just you know spontaneously parallelize a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're thinking about a a a standard functional function, mm-hmm. which is you know input in a transformation, input out, that's there's no state changes there. There's nothing, you know, no side effects. There's an ability to just parallelize a lot of this. I was talking to one of the engineers this morning about spinning up you know, a thousand different machines to be able to uh, rework our event store in mm-hmm. some way. He's like, you know, we can we can redo this whole thing in 10 minutes for like 20 bucks on Azure if we take a thousand machines. And that's that's something that's somewhat easy for us to do because of the way we architected everything. Do you have your own machines? Is there like a room somewhere full of real hardware for you to test on? Or do you you just all spin up Azure when you need it? There may be some teams that have their own actual hardware. As far as I know, it is all virtual and it's all on Azure. Because see, that's really interesting to me. Forgetting about whether it's Azure or Amazon, the idea that startups can be made now where the IT department either doesn't exist or manages DevOps in the cloud. Like, I'm sure your mail is not running on a mail server under someone's desk. It's running, you know, in Gmail or Office 365, right? So for the most part, other than the developer's machines, there's not much else that you would need from an infrastructure perspective. And that allows you to be very agile and change your entire architecture whenever you feel like it. <laughs> it Very much, yes. So you're a month in. Are you having major architectural plans already? Um, yes and no. We've been so happy and so feel so successful with our current architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, like for example, just on on launch day, uh, we did a you know a, a ten times volume load, and our architecture didn't even blink. Like we had no issues. It it was fine. It was you know perhaps maxing out at, at where we could have been, but you know, that was a 10x jump over where we had been the day before. And not an issue at all. So we thought that was awesome enough that, you know, we we have some plans where, you know, we want to rework these things over here. We want to mm-hmm. change this bit over here. But the fundamentals of our architecture, I think, we all think are pretty awesome at this point. You mentioned that you use microservices and the microservices are written in F-sharp traditionally 15, 20 years ago, we talk about like three-tier architecture and you can scale up in places and scale out in places. But when you do microservices, there's probably, I would say, dozens of tiers or layers that can be scaled independently. Is that right? Yes, but sufficiently right. Well, if make, it more, make it more correctly right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the way we think about microservices is... Uh, literally to stop and think about uh, a service as an application of the the single responsibility principle. Mm. Like there should be one and only one uh, function of this microservice. Maybe not actually one function in a programming sense, but one fun- one right one business use. function. Yes, exactly. Uh, 
And you can scale that individual service out if you need to or, you know, or not. And, you know, you can, you can split a service into two and, and create more. It ends up in my mind, it sort of looks like maybe an Erlang installation where, you know, messages are just sort of all over the place randomly. Like, like you might look at a phone network, um, not the, the backend network, but like point to point cell phone calls mm-hmm. are just, you know, what that might look like over the course of, you know, a state <laughs> or a county. And I feel like that's what a, a good microservice installation looks like, which is Do fascinating to me. But uh, sorry. No, it's okay. I'm trying to get my head around this too. And this is really interesting. Do microservices require a call on the network? Like I think people tease microservices a lot because they say, you know, my in-process calls didn't have enough latency. So I've switched to a microservices architecture. And uh, they always say, well, like, you know, you've got all the benefits of just making a function call, except with all of the overhead of HTTP. But do you do you call these over HTTP, like little restful microservices, or are they doing over your pub sub or over your eventing backbone? Yes, the second one. We are doing basically almost everything is event driven. So we are the microservices less call each other than will call into event store or write to event store. Mm-hmm. Do the events like are, are are people listening on queues and listening for events and then jumping on them as opposed to being called in an RPC perspective? Yes, exactly. Um, so we're, you know, microservice will listen to a queue and handle the events from that queue. Uh, or, and when it's finished, maybe pass that on, pass that information on to another service, or maybe there's a side effect and it writes down to our SQL server, or, you know, maybe it will write back directly back up to event store. Maybe it'll just process something and write back to event store. Mm -hmm. And, all of this can be individually scaled because, like you say, you're listening on a queue. The queue depth gets too long. Make the worker exactly or, just work harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're finding that one is insufficient, you know, suddenly you can have ten uh, for the next twenty minutes. Get through everything and then scale back down. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm going to need another half an hour with you to really get my head around this. But the last question I wanted to ask was that you've got F Sharp as your primary language. You've got a whole company full of people doing F Sharp. I'm going to guess in New Jersey, you're not finding as many F Sharp developers as you are C Sharp developers. So do you hire C Sharp developers and how do you get them on board? Um, That is actually one of the functions of my job. We absolutely do hire C Sharp developers um, and we are very much hiring if anyone wants to send in applications. Mm. Um, (laughs) But one of the functions of my job is actually to provide training as everyone on boards. So we have a currently two to three classes. We have some F sharp classes. Uh, I'm working on a microservice class right now, uh, just to make sure that everyone is is up to speed with how Jet handles these things. That's cool. And where is there a career site? Where would someone go to to talk to Jet? Uh, at the bottom of Jet.com, there is a a link to working with us. These links are also on the blog, which is TechGroup.Jet.com. They should also would also be welcome to email our recruiter, who is Amy A I M E E at Jet dot com. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for for talking with me, with me today and for putting up with my silly questions because uh, I'm still learning this space myself. Not at all. This is a ton of fun. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.